In a world where appearance matters more than ever, people are constantly searching for ways to enhance their looks. But what if we told you that the secret to a more attractive, more functional face is not in expensive surgeries or skincare routines, but in something as simple as tongue posture? This is the story of mewing, a technique that has taken the world by storm. We take you to the heart of the controversy, the world of orthotropics, where a father and son duo, Dr. John Mew and Dr. Mike Mew, have been advocating for proper tongue posture and its impact on bone growth for decades. There have been thousands of anecdotal reports from people all over the world who claim that mewing has worked wonders for their breathing, facial form and overall health. While scientific studies are still novel in this area, these personal accounts are a testament to the potential benefits of mewing. In this video, we will present the most comprehensive case for the effectiveness of mewing based on scientific evidence and expert opinions. We will delve into the underlying principles of mewing and how it impacts bone growth, breathing and overall health. By the end of this video, you will have a deeper understanding of the science behind mewing and its potential benefits beyond just anecdotal evidence. We will start with the brief history of mewing beginning with Dr. John Mew, the OG of sharp jawlines. Dr. John Mew is a British orthodontist who has spent his life studying the development of the face, jaws, and teeth. He was one of the first orthodontists to identify that improper tongue posture could lead to improper facial development, which in turn could lead to a variety of health problems. In 1966, Dr. John Mew developed a new field of techniques to guide craniofacial growth. He called it orthotropics, a name derived from the Greek words orthos meaning straight or correct and tropos meaning growth. Orthotropics believes that the change in our lifestyle over the past 10,000 years such as consuming softer foods, living indoors and changing infant feeding methods weakens our jaw muscles and leads to abnormal tongue habits that distorts the jaws and teeth. In contrast, orthodontists concentrate on straightening teeth through mechanical means using wires and brackets and often resort to tooth extraction and surgery. Orthotropics aims to treat malocclusion, a condition in which the upper and lower jaws do not meet properly when the mouth is closed. This can lead to various health problems such as difficulty in chewing, speech and even affect the appearance of the face. Orthotropic principles see malocclusion's treatment as an environmental problem that requires natural solutions using removable palatal widening appliances to create space for the teeth and training braces to correct the underlying problem. Orthotropics places a strong emphasis on firm oral posture, where the tongue is firmly flattened against the roof of the mouth, or mewing, as it is commonly known as today. Unlike orthodontic results that sometimes need to be maintained with retainers in surgery, orthotropic results are considered permanent, as they teach the individuals to make lasting habitual changes, Dr. John Mew has spent his life developing these natural techniques he believes in, but as time went on, so too did the clash of professional opinions. They accused me of deliberate dishonesty because they said, you are telling patients that you can achieve forward growth when we know that is impossible. Therefore, they removed my license to practice. I was 85 years old at the time, and it did not really affect me financially, but it caused me great distress to be accused of a dishonest act. The backlash from some of the orthodontic community to his methods began to increase, and unfortunately the powers that be had removed his ability to practice, simply for requesting more research into alternative methods like orthotropics. Luckily, this is not the end of the story. John Mew was lucky enough to have someone he passed the knowledge and methodologies on to. Enter Dr. Mike Mew, his son, the current reigning jawline king. Dr. Mike Mew has continued his father's work on orthotropics and has expanded upon it in several ways. He has conducted research on the impact of oral posture on craniofacial development and has developed new techniques in this field. Dr. Mike Mew has also created online resources and lectures on the internet to educate the public on the importance of proper oral posture. 
and how it can be achieved through the techniques of orthotropics and mewing. Additionally, Dr. Mike Mew has incorporated technology into his practice, using digital models to assess and treat patients' dental and craniofacial issues. He has also collaborated with other healthcare professionals to explore the potential benefits of orthotropics for conditions such as malocclusion, sleep apnea, and temporomandibular joint disorder, or TMJ. Overall, Dr. Mike New has continued to build upon his father's work and has made significant contributions to the field of orthotropics, bringing mewing into the light of the mainstream. So what exactly is mewing? Essentially, mewing is getting the tongue up against the roof of the mouth with the teeth and lips sealed. It is based on the theory of keeping a correct tongue posture to help guide the growth of the maxilla, the bones of the face, and the mandible, the jaw, in order to prevent incorrect breathing through the mouth and optimizing nasal air intake. Mewing can be broken down into three steps. Step one, place the tip of the tongue on the spot just behind your upper front teeth, not on your teeth. Step two, press the middle and posterior of your tongue against the roof of your mouth and try and flatten your tongue against the roof as much as possible. Teeth together, lips sealed. Step three, suction your tongue upwards towards the roof of your mouth. This is achieved by repeatedly swallowing saliva. Breathe through your nose. This is the correct tongue position to apply pressure to the palate to facilitate forward growth and expansion. Mewing and orthotropics consists of a few other recommendations such as big bolus chewing of mastic gum to work the masseter and other jaw muscles in the face and adopting a firmer diet to mimic the chewing patterns of our ancestors. Mew also recommends tongue chewing which doesn't mean bite your tongue. Tongue chewing involves using the back and mid of the tongue to flatten gum against the roof of the mouth repeatedly to reinforce the mewing tongue posture position. Improving overall thoracic and body posture by standing up straight and avoiding slouching and breathing through the nose, even during exercise are highly regarded by Dr. Mew. A strong emphasis is placed on, as Dr. Mew commonly says, stand up straight and keep your mouth shut. Sounds simple, right? Many are swearing by this technique and are saying that it has improved their face shape and even breathing in some instances. So why the controversy? Dr. John and Dr. Mike Mew's work challenges an entire profession. Their works are new, controversial, and many claim it to be effective. In recent years, Dr. Mike Mew has been involved in a legal battle that has threatened to take away his license and tarnish his and his father's life's work simply for wanting to aid individuals without the use of invasive, often expensive surgery. I go to court for a four week trial at the General Dental Council. I believe that the hard scientific evidence shows that malocclusion, that's crooked teeth and faces which need surgery is clearly an environmental problem caused by our rapidly changing modern environment, how we live. However, a large and possibly the most profitable chunk of dentistry is treating it as if it were genetic. I want to show you some evidence that is in support of orthotropics and mewing. We will analyze and go in depth with this data to create a strong case of scientific evidence to back up all the anecdotes we see swarming around online about mewing. Through careful examination and scrutiny of existing scientific research, we will build a compelling case that proves the efficacy of the revolutionary field of orthotropics and mewing. The anatomy of the face is important to understand to ensure that the concepts that are ahead in this video will be understood. You see references to various different structures of the skull, However, in the interest of specificity, the maxilla and the mandible will be explained, as they are most commonly influenced by mewing and orthotropics. The maxilla is a bone that is located in the upper jaw. It is one of the largest bones in the skull and forms the upper jaw, the hard palate, the sides and the floor of the nasal cavity, and the floor of the orbits, or eye sockets. The mandible is a bone that forms the lower jaw, 
It is the only movable bone in the skull and is connected to the skull by the temporomandibular joint, or TMJ. The mandible is a strong and durable bone that is responsible for supporting the lower teeth and aiding in the process of chewing and speech. You will see both Dr. John and Mike Mew talk about a particular condition called malocclusion and a method to rectify this called maxillary expansion. Malocclusion is a dental condition in which the teeth do not align properly when the jaws are closed. This can result in various problems, including difficulties in chewing, speech, breathing, and even facial appearance. One of the common treatments for malocclusion is maxillary expansion. Maxillary expansion is a process in which the upper jaw or maxilla is widened to correct a narrow palate and create more space for the teeth which helps align the teeth properly, improve bite alignment and oral function. Furthermore, maxillary expansion can improve breathing by widening the airway, reducing snoring or sleep apnea, and alleviate the symptoms of other disorders such as temporomandibular joint disorder and obstructive sleep apnea. Additionally, enhancing facial aesthetics is another benefit of maxillary expansion since a narrow upper jaw can contribute to an unattractive facial appearance. In summary, maxillary expansion is a valuable treatment for malocclusion and other disorders as it improves bite alignment, breathing, and facial aesthetics. But traditional methods aren't necessarily without their criticisms. Wolf's Law, which is also known as the Law of Bone Transformation, states that bone in a healthy person or animal will adapt to the loads under which it is placed. According to this law, if a particular bone or region of the skeleton is subjected to increased mechanical stress, the bone will remodel itself by becoming thicker and stronger, with more bone tissue added to the areas that experience the greatest stress. Real-world examples of how Wolf's Law affects bone growth can be seen in various professions. For instance, professional boxers will develop thicker and denser bones in their hands, wrists, and forearms due to the repetitive impact from punching. Gymnasts develop thicker and stronger bones in their spine and hips due to the high-impact landings they perform on a regular basis. These examples demonstrate that bones can adapt and remodel in response to mechanical stress and loading. A more concentrated example of Wolf's Law is in an aneurysmal bone cyst. This is a rare non-cancerous bone tumor that is caused by the consistent small-scale mechanical stresses placed on the bone. In this case, Wolf's Law is being applied on a microscopic level with small and consistent mechanical stresses, leading to changes in bone shape and structure. Overall, Wolf's Law demonstrates the amazing adaptability of bones to their mechanical environment and that stresses, great or small, can cause remodeling and reshaping. Dr. Weston A. Price was a Canadian dentist who conducted extensive research on the relationship between nutrition, dental health, and physical health. He traveled to various parts of the world, including remote regions of Africa, South America, and the Swiss Alps, to study the diets and health of indigenous people who had not yet been exposed to the modern processed foods. Price's research led him to conclude that traditional nutrient-dense diets were essential for optimal health and that modern processed foods were responsible for a wide range of health problems. Price's research on teeth and jaws led him to conclude that traditional diets rich in whole, unprocessed foods were essential for optimal dental and physical health. He observed that the indigenous peoples he studied had straight teeth, broad dental arches, and well-formed jaws, with little to no incidence of dental caries or other dental problems. Price believed that these positive dental and facial characteristics were a result of the nutrient-dense whole foods that these populations consumed, which provided the necessary vitamins and minerals for proper facial and dental development. He also noted that traditional peoples often engage in practices such as breastfeeding, which help to ensure optimal facial and dental development in infants. Regarding food hardness, Price observed that the traditional peoples often consumed foods that were relatively hard 
and required a lot of chewing, such as tough meats, fibrous vegetables, and hard nuts. He believed that the mechanical stress of chewing and consuming hard foods was essential for promoting healthy dental development and maintaining strong, healthy teeth. However, Price also emphasized the importance of proper preparation techniques, such as soaking, sprouting, and fermenting to increase nutrient availability and digestibility of some of these hard foods. The findings of Dr. Weston Price may have been a result of Wolf's Law being applied to the dentofacial structure upon mastication of firm food. The actual nutritional quality of the food itself, or most likely a combination of these two concepts, mechanical stress and nutrition. Combining the concept of Wolf's Law and Dr. Weston Price's observations, Dr. Mike Mew has suggested that the chewing of firmer foods and also chewing on tough mastic gum is very good at building up the jawline. This claim is directly supported by Tentaluri et al. 2022 that researched the large muscles of mastication on the sides of the jaw, the masseter muscles. The study had found that the gonial angle, which is the angle of the jawline from the side, was smaller in those with more masseter muscle hypertrophy. The smaller angle dictates a more square jaw from the side. The subjects of the study who had longer faces and more recessed jaw angles had less hypertrophy of the masseter, which had matched with existing research on masseter hypertrophy and facial growth. The mechanisms of this can be explained through Wolf's Law. As stated by Wolf, bone morphology can be influenced by the directional force of muscle against the bones of the jaw. Thus, in theory, the greater the muscle strength force over time, the greater potential bone remodeling may occur in response to these forces. This does need to be investigated further to see if the relationship is indeed causal, but the study did present already existing evidence on the topic. These findings can be used as support for what Dr. Weston A. Price and Dr. Mike Mew both believe about firm diets and dentofacial structure. The key takeaway from this study is that the jaw and facial muscles can be developed just like any other muscle in the body, and through Wolf's Law, changes in bone can occur under load. Dr. Mike Mew speaks about the importance of posture in mewing and orthotropics. He has said that poor posture is something that he believes through his observations to be linked to poor craniofacial growth. He often states the common adage, stand up straight and keep your mouth shut. As a metaphor for mewing, there is a study that can support this relationship. A study by Spring Date 2012 aimed to investigate the associations between head posture and growth direction of the face in children. The material comprised of cephalometric radiographs of 59 children recorded in natural head posture at the beginning and end of an observation period. The correlation analysis showed that the strongest associations were between the change in craniocervical posture and variables representing the growth directions of the mandible, anterior maxilla, posterior cranial base, temporomandibular joint, and the change in postural height of the tongue. The findings suggest that the change in posture is primarily linked to the growth direction of the face and coordinated changes in the postures of the mandible and tongue determine the growth direction of the mandible and influence craniocervical posture, possibly via an effect on pharyngeal patency, meaning that changes in posture could affect breathing as an inability to breathe nasally may be compensated by mouth breathing. The study does not support the hypothesis of a causal relationship between initial posture and subsequent facial growth, but does show that correct tongue posture, which is said to influence facial growth, and body posture are interconnected. The mention of pharyngeal patency being influenced by posture in this study as a possible factor opens up new potential for further research to study links between posture, tongue posture, mouth breathing, and facial growth. There are some studies that have seen improved breathing can occur from expanding the maxilla, which has an effect on the nasal cavity. This study by Escheri et al. 1998 used a computer model of a skull to see how rapidly expanding the upper jaw, the maxilla, affects the bones and structures in the face. The model showed that when the maxilla was expanded up to 5 mm on both sides, there was a widening of the dentoalveolar areas and the nasal cavity at the floor of the nose. 
High stress levels were observed in certain areas, including the canine and molar regions of the maxilla, lateral wall of the inferior nasal cavity, zygomatic and nasal bones, and the pterygoid plates of the sphenoid bone. The widening of the nasal cavity could allow for potentially better breathing as there would be less obstruction. Theoretically, this is good support for the concept that if mewing can expand the maxilla, it can allow nasal breathing easier. If a subject were a mouth breather due to nasal obstruction or a constricted nasal airway. Now, granted, this is using a three-dimensional model, but there are some real-world studies. The study by Chuchieva, Chuchkova et al. 2016, which investigated craniofacial improvements in rapid maxillary expansion patients. The study did conclude that the expansion of the maxilla was capable of providing increased nasopharyngeal airway adequacy, changing the head posture as well as the position of the mandible and tongue creating the conditions for myofunctional balance and proper development of the craniofacial complex, and changing the mode of respiration from mouth to nasal. Maxillary expansion, which we now know involves widening the upper jaw, can have a significant impact on the appearance of a person's face. This is because the upper jaw plays a critical role in framing the face and defining its proportions. When the upper jaw is too narrow, it can make the nose and chin appear more prominent, creating an unbalanced or asymmetrical look. By expanding the upper jaw, the face can be brought into better alignment, creating a more harmonious and balanced appearance. This can have a positive effect on overall facial aesthetics, making the face look more attractive and youthful. And of course, in addition to the cosmetic benefits, maxillary expansion, as we know, can improve breathing and other functional issues related to the mouth and jaw. And let's be honest, who doesn't want a better looking face? I assume a lot of you probably said yes to that last question. Of course, it's rhetorical. There is a study that has shown uh, non-surgical appliances using orthotropic principles has shown a significant effect in facial attractiveness when used to expand the maxilla. Research by Professor G. Dave Singh demonstrates the achievement of facial enhancement in 19 to 26 year old adults through the application of orthotropic principles for only one year. Upon closer examination, the 26 year old's face in the study appeared to have shortened and come forward, resulting in a more pronounced jaw and fuller mid face. In the study, 12 adults participated and objective changes were tracked by measuring several facial angles. Significant changes in the labiomental and thyromandibular angles were found. It has been shown that in other studies, using biomimetic oral appliance therapy, or BOAT, can increase mid-facial bone volume in adults non-surgically. And this study supports the hypothesis that BOAT can also improve the jawline, maxilla, and overall facial harmony. Maxillary expansion seems to make faces look better and has an overall positive effect on attractiveness on more than just your jawline. There are some claims that mewing will give you some nice high model-like zygomatic bones or cheekbones. Based on the computer model of the previous study by Isseri et al. 1998, the cheekbones were also seen to be placed under a high stress level during rapid maxillary expansion. In fact, the zygomatic bones were said to have received the highest stress level in this study compared to other areas of the face during RME. In particular, the anterior or front portion of the zygomatic bones received this stress. Thus, the take-home points of these two studies I've just mentioned is that facial attractiveness can be improved through the expansion of the maxilla. In particular, the study by Singh presents good evidence for mewing and its potential for maxillary expansion and effect on attractiveness. So, how much force is actually needed to expand the maxilla? If there's so many benefits to it, how can we achieve this? This is a measurement that has many different variables to it. However, there are some studies that provide figures on the required forces that have been used in maxillary expansion on patients. Using rapid maxillary expansion, the amount of force necessary to separate the mid-palatal suture is around 900 to 4,500 grams, which is significantly greater than the force required to move the teeth, which ranges from 10 to 150 grams. The underlying theory behind the application of substantial force is to dislocate the circummaxillary suture, leading to orthopedic expansion before any tooth movement actually occurs. 
Results with one kilogram of maxillary force have been seen in the study by Kelsey et al. 2002. The study used 20 patients with maxillary retrognathism of class 3 into randomly allocated groups of 2. The first group consisted of 9 patients with an average age of 8.58 years, while the second group comprised of 11 patients with an average age of 8.51 years. Patients were to wear a rapid maxillary expansion face mask that was fixed to the subject for a total of 16 hours per day for the first 3 months, then 12 hours per day for the last 3 months. The appliance was set to provide 500 grams of force to the maxilla unilaterally. Results from this particular study found that after the treatment, both groups did show forward growth of the maxilla using the lower end of the force spectrum, one kilogram in total. The semi-rapid rate is far preferable to either the slow rate, which does not really encourage the growth of the bone at all, except in very young children, and the fast rate, which encourages the growth um, of the bone, but damages the teeth. And there is a period of six months or so before the bone grows into the intervening space. Dr. John Mew in this video does believe that there are issues with rapid maxillary expansion being, in fact, too rapid. There is evidence for this, as summarized by Al Mutsian et al. 2016. Some adverse effects that can arise from rapid maxillary expansion are pain and soreness during the active phase of expansion, which occurs in almost all cases, in 98%. Rapid maxillary expansion treatment can cause temporary damage to the dental pulp and periodontal tissues, as well as a minor loss of bone support. Gingival tissue irritation and inflammation can occur due to pressure necrosis and plaque accumulation around the appliance component. This can make it harder to maintain good oral hygiene during treatment. Dr. John Mew has stated that the slow maxillary expansion may only be effective in younger children as the craniofacial sutures and structures are much more malleable to slow maxillary expansion forces. It is a great way to mitigate the disadvantages of rapid maxillary expansion. However, according to this study by Patil et al. 2023, the forces of 450 to 900 grams in slow maxillary expansion are not adequate to act on the maturing sutures. So what's the solution? Dr. Mu believes semi-rapid expansion to be ideal for avoiding the nefarious results of rapid maxillary expansion, but also providing the strength that slow maxillary expansion cannot. Therefore, it can be said that the optimal maxillary expansion would require a force intermediate to slow expansion and rapid expansion ranges on the maxilla. Based on the SME ranges of 450 grams to 900 grams, and the RME ranges of 900 grams to 4,500 grams, it can be said that 900 grams is an appropriate approximate. Of course, we must also take into consideration deviations for more or less force based upon the specific variables, such as age, gender, and condition. We now know that the sweet spot for a balanced maxillary expansion force is approximately 900 grams, the next step is to find out if the tongue has the required strength to meet the demands of maxillary expansion. The study by Burke et al. 2021 had found that the range for maximum tongue strength in males was 5.3 to 31.8 newtons of force, and the ranges for females was 5 to 23.3 newtons, with the average being 13.6 and 10.5 newtons respectively. The study used a measurement device called the Iowa Oral Performance Instrument, or IOPI. Now that the newtons have been discovered, they must be converted into grams for the comparison. To convert newtons to grams, we can use the conversion factor 1 newton is equal to 101.97 grams. Therefore, the mean maximum force for males of 13.6 newtons would be approximately 1,387 grams, rounded to the nearest gram, and the range of maximum forces for males from 5.3 to 31.8 newtons would be approximately 540 grams to 3,240 grams. 
the mean maximum force for females of 10.5 newtons would be approximately 1,071 grams rounded to the nearest gram, and the range of maximum forces for females from 5 to 23.3 newtons would be approximately 510 to 2,370 grams. So, we now know that for a balanced intermediary maxillary expansion force, one would need approximately 900 grams applied to the maxilla, and we now know that males can produce 1,387 grams, and females can produce 1,071 grams of tongue force on average. These numbers do directly match the force requirements for expanding the maxilla, and in some instances, depending on the patient or subject involved, exceed the force required for the lower requirements of expansion. This may be useful information for younger patients involved in mewing or orthotropics, as the midline suture of the face is affected by lower forces. Compared to adults, there may still be somewhat of an effect, but this does need to be investigated further. While these findings are promising for the effectiveness of mewing, the figures from these studies on tongue strength were calculated for the maximal strength of the tongue, meaning that patients performed several attempts at generating the most force possible. But what we do know is that one, the maxilla adapts to the upward forces applied to it, and two, the tongue can actually meet these requirements for expansion. Further recommendations for the knowledge of the science behind mewing would be investigation into the muscle memory effects, tongue endurance, individual differences in age, dental conditions, tongue and palate size, shape and strength also need to be accounted for. In summary, we have looked into the history, methods and science behind mewing and orthotropics. We have seen that there is indeed evidence that is existing to support Dr. John and Dr. Mike Mew's advice on firm diets, posture, and maxillary changes from tongue pressure. It is important to note that this evidence is not complete as of yet, and we cannot prove something to be fully efficacious until studies directly utilizing mewing under specific controls has been undertaken. But with that being said, when these results come to light, I'm sure the results will shock the world for the better. If you did like the video, please feel free to like and subscribe to the channel. The channel is undergoing a huge transformation, and if you were interested in future content like this, please also feel free to donate in the Patreon as well. On a final word in regards to the topic, I will appreciate healthy discussion and debate among any fellow academics or anyone out there within the comments section below. Do you think mewing works? Let me know below. Thanks again.